Hi, everyone. You are at the Python Pulse. I am so excited today. This is a special bonus episode, if you were not aware. My name is Dawn Wages. I'm the Python community advocate here at Microsoft, and I'm thrilled to bring you another episode this month. Uh, we're usually on the second Friday of each month, but when on a awesome occasions, when we have topics too cool to reschedule, you find us on the fourth Friday today um, at 11 a.m. Pacific time. This week, we'll be jumping into data science and VS Code with the Jupyter Notebook extension. Jupyter Notebooks are the computa computational data scientist's tool of choice. And we'll cover the fundamentals of what you can do in case you're coming to the stream curious. Uh, but if you're like me, I've had several years of Jupyter Notebook experience. I even remember when it was called IPython. But it's not my day to day. There's a lot I've forgotten. And I also am really excited to see all of the ways that we support the integrated features in VS Code. So you're absolutely in the right place. And then if you're an expert, you want to know more from experts, we some have some really cool experts on the stream. We have Sujin Choi, the product manager for the Jupyter extensions. And then we also have Dr. Sarah Kaiser, a Python cloud developer advocate. I'm truly just chuffed today. So we're going to jump in. Uh, but first, I'm going to do some announcements. So the Python functions 3.10 support is generally available. Uh, with functions on Azure, you're able to develop event-driven serverless code functions that solve complex orchestration problems, deploy and operate at scale in the cloud using triggers and bindings. And we're now supporting Python 3.10 ahead of some of our serverless competitors that shall not be named. So we are kicking butt ahead of schedule and uh, jump in try it out, write some things. We love sharing uh, community blog posts and resources and videos about our new features. So jump in where there's just call to action. Come on and jump in. The water's great. Uh, next, we have the Azure Developer CLI, which is a command line interface for Azure solutions and provides a clear path for writing code for the cloud. In the most recent release, we've added new templates for Python, Dapper, JavaScript, and Java, support for command and service hooks, installation options, and some community contributions. And there's a shout out to all of the community contributors in there, too. Again, we love community here. Uh, you are on the VS Code channel. Uh, VS Code is used around the world. And if you didn't know VS Code developer experience supported Pythonesis like us, now you do. And we are now facilitating Pythonesis to build their own Python-based extensions. The Python extension template helps you get started with building your own VS Code extension for your favorite Python tool. We love seeing Python extension activity, and we've been highlighting some of those maintainers. I want to give a special shout out to the rough extension that is now available in our marketplace. Shout out to Charlie R. Marsh for that contribution. Uh, Azure App Service now supports Python 3.11. The Azure App Service team is celebrating 10 years of their free tier as well. So for students, hobbyists, and entrepreneur Pythonistas looking for free Azure app deployment, check out the options that we have to get your app into the cloud. And for those who have not had a chance to play around with App Service yet, Azure App Service is fully managed platform as a service offering to developers. It supports multiple languages and frameworks in a managed production environment, and you have a uh, opportunity to run multi-container apps, access to DevOps optimization, API, and mobile features, and serverless code, among many other things. Um, and we also have more AZD templates. So those AZD templates, um, we've been adding a lot, um, and we will continue to add more as we are leading up to our presence at PyCon. Um, that's going to be April 19th. We're excited to see everyone there. There's going to be an online portion. There's going to be an offline portion in IRL. We're really excited to engage with everybody as we're leading up to this like, big giant PyCon US push. So really, really thrilled. And also really thrilled to introduce our amazing guests today. Uh, first, I'll introduce Sujin Choi. Hi, how are you doing, Sujin? Do you want to give Hello. a introduction about yourself and what you do? Yeah, uh, really great to be here. My name is Sujin. I am a PM for the Jupyter Notebooks, as well as data science experiences in VS Code. Um, I work closely with the Python team and the VS Code core team, um, and also the Code Spaces team. So really happy to be here to talk about all of those things. Um, and yeah, 
thanks for having so, me here. <laughs> yay, so excited to be here. This is great. We were just chatting right before the call. Like this is the first time that I've been able to just be on a stream with Sujin. And so I'm really just thrilled. We were just chatting about energies earlier today. <laughs> and so next, uh, I want to introduce Sarah Kaiser on the stream. Hi, Sarah. Do you want to give a little blurb about yourself as well? Hey, everybody. Uh, yeah, um, I am Sarah. <laughs> I've been working with Jupyter Notebooks and Python for a long time, mostly in uh, research hardware development. Uh, I'm a quantum physicist by training, so I blow have blown up many things with lasers, all controlled from Jupyter Notebooks. <laughs> so um, yeah, and I, I work now, as Don said, as a cloud developer advocate uh, for kind of the scientific Python, AI, ML sort of space at Microsoft. I'm so excited. So I, I'm letting you all run the show. I'm here. I'm going to be asking some questions. I'm going to be watching the chat. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, and I, whose screen should I should I share first? Um, Are we going to jump into something else? Maybe maybe mine. Um, okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, we'll just go with that. So. Sure. Um, before we do any of this sharing stuff, um, we just wanted to say that we want this to be as co communicative as possible. Um, we will stop at any point to just chat with you all. Um, I think we just want this to be a super just like chill um, live stream since it is a bonus one as well. Um, we do have some things prepped, um, but it's not like an end-to-end -end demo per se. Um, we're happy to jump around at any point. Um, so with that, um, I the the Basically, the goal of this for us is to kind of give you all some practical tips um, that you can use right away to make your data work easier. And I say data work, not specifically data science work, because Sarah will hate me for saying this. I don't consider myself a data scientist. I consider myself a citizen data scientist. So I honestly, I don't, I, I find that data science is no, no, no longer just like a job title. It's, it's more like everybody has some use of data. If you're using computer at any point, VS code, um, you're probably dealing with some kind of data. So um, I'm all for democratizing data science. I am just, I am a citizen data scientist. Um, but anyways. Uh, I love that. That's so great. <laughs> I mean, we can like, just pause on that real quick. That's yeah. really, I mean, that was really great. And it actually, I, I had a qualifier too. Like I don't do data science all the time. I don't touch Jupyter notebooks all the time anymore. And it's a little bit intimidating for me as well. So I, I appreciate that like preface that this, this could be a stream for me too. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and the thing, great thing about Jupyter notebooks is you can do highly skilled things like, um, like Sarah does or used to do um, <laughs> as a quantum physicist. Um, but you can also just be a student who's learning how to code and you can see your output interactively right away, um, which is what, you know, what I think is really cool about Jupyter Notebooks. Um, specifically, though, I think it's really cool about, yeah. Can you zoom in real quick? <laughs> yes, I will zoom in. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I zoomed in the wrong screen. Uh, zoom in. Um, is that better? Nice. Can you one more? One more. One more. I guess my screen is bigger than I thought. Yay, cool. Okay, great. Um, and I'm not really talking to anything on here for, for now, but um, oh, I lost my train of thought. Um, but anyways, uh, no, 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 it's okay. I like, I swear I have ADHD. I never got like, no, you know, diagnosed or anything. But anyways, um, I wanted to talk about uh, just Jupyter Notebooks in VS Code. Um, why it's so great with NVS Code is that it it's basically you can have it all inside VS Code, right? Like it is your development environment and it can be your playground as well. Um, for those of you who wants to just use notebooks as a part of just like testing things out. Um, so I will actually start off with something that I think is super cool and exciting that's still pretty relatively new. Um, okay. It's called Code Spaces. Um, and some of the yeah. experiences that we have in uh, code spaces. Yeah, so I don't know how much um, any everybody knows about code spaces or, or to what extent. Um, I know uh, I Pamela probably talked about it. 
I know that we had like a really great, big, splashy announcement. Yeah. Um, Coast Spaces is, is in partnership with GitHub. I know that it's a development environment for us that is spun up from um, a repo um, and that there is a sp specific commands that you can do to include what you need in Code Spaces. But I'm a novice and we can also assume maybe some people on the stream are, um, that we have and people are coming in too, it's great. Um, our novices as well. So maybe we could get the one-on-one on what code spaces is. Yeah, I, I think you almost nailed it actually. It's basically a cloud development environment okay. um, that you have access to through your browser. Um, and when I say browser, it's not just the browser, you can access it through VS Code as well. Um, and so it's it's basically a development environment that's um, available for you for free-ish. Um, so there's uh, every month you get 60 core hours um, of code spaces for free, um, and you can add it on to that if you want to. So you can, you know, whenever you create a code space, um, you can think about what core do I want it to be? It can be a two core, four core, um, what have you, right? Um, so you can kind of think about that as well. Um, and then at code spaces is basically you can, the way I think of it is you can have your VS Code, like your development environment, right from your your wherever you're comfortable with. Um, so you can your development environment kind of goes with you is is the um, is the way I think about it. Um, I think one thing that I did want to mention is that you mentioned that it is code space is based on a repo. That is okay. very true, and that's where we did start. But it actually could be repo less as well. Um, so that's when great. you go to GitHub.com/slash/codespaces, um, we actually now have these things called templates. Um, you can create a blank template, React template, whatever you, there's, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, of course, my favorite is Jupyter Notebooks. It's one of the ones that are featured right there. Um, so if you click on use template here, it basically, oh, um, it, uh, creates a code. Oh, sorry. Um, I swear I tested this right before. Um, <laughs> That's okay. Live demos are also really tough, but what, what, what was the, what is the expected experience? And then also what's like, what's kind of happening? <laughs> Yeah, so basically um, what's happening is that I am part of both Microsoft and GitHub organizations. So it's, right. I've signed into Microsoft um, and now it's complaining that I haven't signed into GitHub, <laughs> I think is what was happening before. So okay. you might run into this, but obviously it's it's not a hard thing where you have to like Google to, to figure out what, what you need to do. It's pretty easy and you just yeah, no, no. enter your pen. It's that's um, a common thing that happens so like which or are you part of like that uh, yeah i just wanted to know what was, <laughs> was going on on the screen as we're like talking through it and sure stuff. And i also wanted to take a pause because i usually do this at the very beginning we're only so many episodes but you mentioned yeah. code spaces you can do everywhere we are in different places of the i think we are all in the continental us is that correct i'm in from philadelphia and other places here and people who are watching if you want to like add into the chat where you're from i could like share Shout you out and say hello uh but i i think it also is just really in line with what we're doing today because we're working on on um work streams that like you could take everywhere and we're using tools you could take everywhere using in the browser yeah yeah absolutely yeah. um so what i just did here is i created a repo less code space so this is think of it as and i hate mentioning that I'm just kidding, but collab, right? So once you go to collab, that's kind of what it is, is it's a repo less, just like a notebook environment. That's exactly what you get here too. Um, so I know here we have uh, some sample notebooks for you to try out as well. And if you don't want to, um, you think this is cluttery, then you can just delete all of them too. Okay. Um, so that's basically what code, repo less code spaces is. Um, and uh, if you look at your, uh, um, some of the Python environments that are already installed on there. Um, you can see some, you know, the ones that you probably are used to using for data work. Plotly's there, right? Like um, Pandas is there somewhere. I don't know my alphabets, apparently. Pandas right there, um, so on and so forth. So um, that's basically, it's super easy to get started with. Um, so I wanted to mention that it is a repo list thing that you can also take advantage of. Um, and when you did mention, though, that you can, um, it, it is, you know, uh, attached to a repository, um, mm -hmm. GitHub, you know, GitHub is very store your, uh, your repo. So it is very much attached to any of your repos that you wanted to attach to. Okay. Um, so for example, this is the one, um, a code spaces that I've created. So here's a repo and this is don't judge me on the code, just 
this is the flow that we're going to go with. Um, but um, yeah, so once you click on code, what you used to see was just the local part of it. You can clone it and, and, and all of that. But now you have this code spaces tab where you can create your code spaces here. Um, I don't think it actually reloaded for me. I should have a code spaces there um, that I created earlier. Um, and um, yep, I have laughing doodle. <laughs> they just create these names for you, which is always so much fun. Um, cute. But what I did here. <laughs> I love it, um, is I went with options. Um, mm -hmm. and, and this is, I guess, a, a little preview for what's to come, um, is that I have a preview of um, GPU instance. Um, and so you can get um, access to a GPU later down the road. Um, but that's basically what I did to create this code spaces here. It mm -hmm. looks very similar to Visual Studio Code, um, and it even has like all of my themes and everything because I have something called the setting sync turned on. Um, so if you're on Visual Studio Code, you go on this little gear button um, and you can turn on setting sync. I mean, there's multiple ways to do it. You can do it through um, the command palette and everything as well. But since I have my setting sync turned on, um, my VS Code on my desktop looks exactly the same as the one that's on Code Spaces. Um, and uh, this is the one I created earlier, and it does take a little bit of time since it is um, training a model. Um, so I, I ran it earlier. And so if you look at it here, um, it is using CUDA. Um, um, and so uh, to, to train um, a model that I created earlier. So I'm going to actually stop here to, to see if there's any questions. Um, I know I feel like I talk too much. No, you're great. You're you're okay. great. And that and just another reminder that anyone in, in the chat and all of our friends watching here, we have like a good number. Um, feel free to add questions into the chat. We love for this to be conversational. I think yes. you're you're doing great, Susan. Sure, sure. Um, so just to give you a little bit of I guess um, uh, context to what what I did here was I used um, transform hugging face hugging face transformers, um, oh, cool. uh, and I went from I, I took a GPT two model mm -hmm. um, and uh, I I basically read in um, I think there was a, 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 a data set on Kaggle. Um, which was Medium, you know, the, the website, blogging website, Medium, right? Like the Medium post that had some tech posts, or I think it had like the tech um, uh, tag on it or something like that. And I took right. that um, uh, in order to kind of create some uh, some model for me to say, hey, like if I start a sentence, um, can you complete it for me? Um, and so I... Yeah. Just for a moment, I so I know of Hugging Face. Like I, I mm -hmm. know they're like, so hugging face and then GPT for those who may not know, like what what do they do? Can you read me in? Oh my gosh, I am by no means expert on this. Maybe Sarah, you can help me out here. Um, Sarah, do you want to help me out? <laughs> this, is, this is where I get to tag in, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah so uh, the hugging face transformers here are basically uh, it's an open source project where. They're basically tools to help you kind of take whatever your data set is to a format to tokenize it to basically make it something that you can do inference on or do training on, um, hence the transforming part. Um, GPT-2 is a model, so that's basically what you would feed. You would basically, as you had there, you have your data, you run it through transformers. Now it's something you can either literally put into the input of the model and get your output uh, or, you know, do whatever training process, uh, which was what you were doing with the GPU stuff there. Awesome. Thank you um, for explaining that. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, some other things I wanted to, to flag with the cool stuff that you had there uh, that I use when I use code spaces. Um, one is you can open, like, I have a lot of browser tabs and my browser crashes a lot. <laughs> so sometimes working directly like with my VS Code window in my browser doesn't work so great. But uh, when you're in code spaces, uh, you can launch it. Uh, you can basically connect to that code space from your local VS Code windows too. So um, that's honestly when <laughs> most of the time when I'm using code spaces, I think it's, uh, yeah, the little yellowy boy you can you can either from your local one reach out and connect to a code space or if you're in the web code space 
Mm -hmm. uh, you can basically say, hey, I'm done in the, the web window here. Please reopen me in the desktop. I think we did something um, about that like experience with, for those, shout out to Pamela Fox. We did a really, really cool um, stream um, for dev containers just like a, a few Fridays ago. So check out that stream as well. But I think we might have done a little bit of that experience too. Okay, cool. That was a good shout out. Yeah, and, and Jay also reminds, you can also do it in a PWA mode. So like if uh, the progressive web app, so you can basically take that tab and install it as an app uh, for browsers and operating systems that support that. So um, I think that was one thing from what you're talking about. And two, uh, you talked about setting sync, which uh, I absolutely love. <laughs> it means that whenever I'm, you know, I have like six different machines in places, I don't have to like reinstall and set up things everywhere. Um, but there's also a somewhat new feature called profiles, which uh, can you, Sujin, click where profiles are? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so under settings, like right next to setting sync is profiles. So um, basically it allows you to kind of, I, I use VS Code now in a bunch of different ways. Like when I'm actually doing my data science or machine learning work, I have a bunch of extensions that I need for that stuff. If I am doing, if I just need to like get stuff done and I want like a really blank Zen mode sort of thing and I just want all the buttons hidden, <laughs> I have another like I'm writing <laughs> profile mode or doing demos uh, where I can have the zoom level set. Uh, so this is like one of my new favoritest <laughs> VS Code features. Um, and you can even in code spaces, you can kind of swap around and, and pick your profile. So cool. That's I what I wanted to highlight. <laughs> yeah, I haven't done all of my tweaking yet. I have a couple and they're like, oh, there's, I'm not super organized in it, but you have like inspired, we were talking about it previously before the stream started, inspired me to, to step up my profiles game. <laughs> cool. Thanks so much, Shujin. So, okay, what are we looking at? Okay, so um, yes. Thank you, Sarah, for, for explaining Hugging Face and for, for all of your, your comments on how to make VS Code even better, yeah, even better for, for your workflow. Um, yeah, so where was I? Um, so you, I think what you saw here, um, when I like briefly switched to the Hugging Face website, you could mm -hmm. use that GPT-2 model as is. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I tried out first is I, I tokenized it and I said, hey, like if I start the sentence with, I think data scientists use VS Code as their tool, um, and then it completed it for me, basically, cool. uh, completed some of the sentence for me. Um, but what I did here that I thought was more interesting is actually um, is fine tune uh, the, the model. So fine tuning is basically, and oh my gosh, I hate that I'm speaking about this, but um, you're making the model better for your use. Um, so I, I fine tune the model to kind of fit the needs of um, uh, for, for, for the data set that I got. Okay, um, that makes sense. Um, and yeah. so that and that training run um, actually took 14 minutes um, here. Uh, and that's why I didn't want to demo uh, in, yeah. in real time. That's really good but, uh, context too, like on how long that like the training the model actually could take if somebody was going to try to re recreate this scenario themselves. Okay, very cool. So one thing to note is just, it was just one epoch. Um, okay. it, it, obviously this is not what you would do in real life. Um, you would probably have a lot more and it would be a more robust um, fine tuning uh, experience, but this was also like a demo for me as well. Um, so it'll, it might be you know longer than this, but it is better than just having some kind of GPU on demand for you to maybe use and maybe not, maybe available, maybe not. This is like, if you actually have access to beta testing GPU or like mm -hmm. when that becomes available, you will have GPU like for sure. Um, so it is actually very performant in that sense. Um, and yeah, so what I wanted to show actually was that's, that's basically what I did. Mm -hmm. And I created this class gap, like super duper. This is where I, I'm like, don't judge me on, on my coding skills. This is um, a safe place. We love to just play in <laughs> Python code. This is totally safe place. Um, and so um, code spaces is really cool in that it automatically forwards your, your port, right? And so it's, it, it's right. also very, um, very similar in like a, a data science and machine learning kind of type too. So mm -hmm. Flask is obviously not just used for data science. Um, and so if you do Flask uh, run, um, it'll basically forward that uh, for this port for you automatically. So when you open it up, um, you'll be able to see kind of, um, I don't know, a machine, um, uh, 
the, the, the machine learning model, the fine tuned model in action. Um, I don't know if this will be a very good sentence. Like I said, I'm not an ML developer, um, but I think it actually kind of makes sense. Yeah. I can, yeah. I can read it. Let's see. Okay. A machine learning engineer develops machine learning tools. His personal machine learning tool was built through an extensive study of, of a variety of methods of learning AI. This makes sense. This is, okay. The article aims to summarize the tools used, whether they were specifically designed for creating AI or for developing a complex <laughs> tool like Al. This is, this makes sense. I like that. <laughs> Okay. So it was fine-tuned on blogs, so it, it okay. kind of talks about like articles and things like that. But yeah, as you can see, like um, there's you know cool things that, that can be done. And this was I didn't even go to my uh, my desktop one for for this one. I just I, I was straight up like in code spaces on the browser. I'm okay with using the browser. I know like Sarah mentioned, like some people like just are not happy with it. I know a, a guy who like used to use Emacs, so like Control W would be his like cut yeah. or copy or whatever um and then but it like closed the window and he's like what the hell um, <laughs> so yeah like it, i just just i think that just great things i think um for yeah for it, it allows the flexibility and, you know, yeah exactly. yep cool um and then the other thing that i wanted to mention going back to the notebook just ui right i think you're probably seeing um some things that you might not see, for example, you probably see this execute group one and execute group two. Okay. Um, these are one of the experimental features that we have. And when I say experimental features, you might have seen or heard of um, an extension called uh, Jupyter Power Toys. Um, and that's what that is from. Uh, so basically, um, any of the, the, the experiences that we want to experiment with, but we just don't have the bandwidth to actually like you know, test it and, and fully test it and make sure that it's like a great experience and put it into the main um, mm -hmm. extension. Um, it goes into the power toys. So it it's basically a, an extension that helps to um, improve your productivity in a way, but we're just, they're just not stable features. So it's like, give it a try. And like, if you really like it and it's working for you, like let us know kind of a thing. And then we'll we'll, we'll work to to make sure that that gets into the the main, uh, the core Jupyter extension. That sounds um, so fun though. Yeah. That's very cool. I love that. And so we have like, we have other ex examples of that, like the VS Code. Yeah. Does. I really love that just the iterative, uh, the iterative approach that uh, VS Code takes in prioritizing features. It's just very community focused. They build out in the open. I love that. Thanks for pointing that out. That's great. Yeah, for sure. Um, I wanted to do a, a quick, quick call out on this experimental feature as well. So contextual help and, and kernel kind of manager are the two ones that actually get called out a lot from our community. Um, and we are considering putting that into the main extension, but it's just, okay. we, you know, I, I think the Python team also said it um, in their Python Pulse um, uh, session as well, where, you know, they like to communicate with the, their users essentially on GitHub um, or wherever, right? And so we really take community input seriously. So if, you know, if you want any of this into the main product or, or what have you, like we would love, you know, you know your, your upvotes or comments or anything. Um, and that'll help us kind of uh, help prioritize some of these things. Right. And with that, that's that link that we talked about before, the best way to get in contact with yep. um, y'all. Is that correct? Okay. I'm yep. going to put that in the chat too. Exactly. Awesome. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you keep going. I'm going to add it to the chat. <laughs> cool. I think this is a good time for me to actually stop and like I just hand it off to Sarah because Sarah is, I would say, one of the power users of this and like anything that she likes and doesn't like about um, notebooks uh, in, in Jupyter, like you can be as mean as possible because. Um, so. I don't want to be mean. <laughs> I do provide. I do regularly, though, put uh, like the feedback on the dis uh, both of the discussions on GitHub and like filing issues. The team is obviously. I can go bug them uh, on Teams directly, but they are also really, really responsive on GitHub. So. Uh, definitely, always encourage if you run into something that even if you don't think it's a bug. Put it up there. <laughs> I will literally ping Luciano. I'm like, is this a bug or is this me? And she's like, put put it on GitHub. Just create an issue. We communicate out in the open as well. So I mean, you're we're we're directing you to the same channels. Cool. Mm. Okay. Um, is there a particular? Let me. 
Was there a particular um, kind of feature we haven't gotten to yet that? Uh, um, maybe some of the know. outline stuff. Okay. Um, yeah. What else? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I so haven't talked much want, about like the UI. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so if somebody wants to swap over to me. Sure, yeah, uh, yeah. Put you on screen. There you go. Uh, and, and we do oh, this one. Haha. -ha. Got it. Okay. We're we're getting a good theme here. <laughs> Ooh, and I, honestly, I kind of love that you're just like Ooh. switching through. Cool. There we go. Laser wave uh, is one of my favorites for definitely no obvious reasons whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I think um, a lot of my daily workflow when I'm working with notebooks, um, I'm going to talk uh, in a second about kind of dev containers and how that works uh, with code spaces. But Oh, Capuchin, <laughs> favorite theme. Nice, Jay. Um, yeah, so like I used the Jupyter, like also IPython notebooks back when they were called that, <laughs> uh, in the browser pretty much exclusively um, until I started using them in VS Code. And so like I really appreciate that all of like the key bindings and stuff that I would expect, you know, like hitting escape uh, B or A to make new cells. Um, you know, I can do the standard select my kernel here. Please don't judge me because I have a bajillion <laughs> conda <laughs> environments. <laughs> like, let's not talk about this and or remember why my computer is slow. Um, <laughs> I hoard them, you know, like you never, you're like, well, but I don't know if I need this environment oh, anymore. Guilty. Anyway, um, <laughs> those are on my local machine. This is why I like dev containers because it prevents me from hoarding those. Um, but anyway, like, so we have our, I've, I've got, uh, I've just got a notebook here where actually what I did was I scraped the GitHub API for all of the repo, like basically metadata about the repos for the Jupyter organization. Cool. <laughs> so um, basically, and, and uh, I, I'll, when I toggle off next, I'll put a link to this repo on um, in the chat. But okay. basically, uh, you can see there's all kinds of different ways, you know, whether you use keyboard shortcuts or not. Uh, a lot of the UI elements for like adding in new cells. Um, the other one that I also really like is because sometimes my notebooks get really long. <laughs> this one, thankfully, is not too bad, but uh, there's an outline here. So like you can just hop to different um, headings or even particular like markdown or um, uh, you can also do code cells. I think I have that turned off right now in this th in this uh, profile. But yeah, it makes it really easy to navigate because um, I am maybe not the world's best uh, not print debugger. <laughs> um, you know, I, I initially started using Jupyter Notebooks because they were a great way to kind of running a whole script. Like I felt like I was wasting things <laughs> if I was running the whole script every time. So I really like that I could just rerun particular cells. And I think the combination of doing something like that and <laughs> using the variable explorer uh, here is kind of like, that's mainly what I used out of debuggers right. uh, anyway. Yep. I, if you like debuggers, you can totally do all of the normal VS code debugging and stuff in your notebooks, you can debug a cell at a time. This is just doing imports, so it's not like actually interesting. <laughs> I think I found wow, that, nothing to debug. I think I found the notebook that you were referring to is Pi Data Global 2022. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I'm Thank sure. you. Cool. I'll Thank add you. it to the chat. Um, yeah, so this was for a workshop that I did recently. Uh, and what was really cool is because everyone has access to code spaces for free um, with obviously some, some usage limits. When I go to do a workshop, if I have like, you know, demos and stuff like this, I can have people like the most painful thing, you know, when you're trying to, whether it's helping your coworkers, you setting up a new machine right. is reproducing that dev environment. And so like my, <laughs> why I was so excited about code spaces and dev containers is that it's really, really easy to just make it a one click experience. So like, yeah. you know, for example, uh, I have um, I actually did a blog post recently where I tried to make the fastest like conda 
you know, scientific Python based uh, code space spin up time. Cool. Uh, so I use Mamba and other sorts of things to speed it up. Um, this is the, here I will give it to you. Or actually I can just put it in chat too. Cause I what was chatting Mamba? with people earlier. I think I've heard of it, but I don't, I don't think I've ever used mm -hmm. Mamba. So Mamba is a, it's like a wrapper for Conda. So Conda is a, another package manager for mm -hmm. Python like pip. Um, but Conda it differs in that you can include dependencies that are not strictly Python. So like this comes up a lot in scientific uh, computing is like depending on your operating system, I usually end up testing things on Windows because um, I <laughs> like to be different. Um, mm -hmm. But when I set things up, you know, Windows doesn't necessarily have all the same compilers that say a Linux machine or a Mac may not have um, the same compilers. And so like Conda makes it easy when you have like really scientific libraries and stuff that do a lot of the machine learning and stuff like that, it just kind of makes sure you have all of the tools you need to build uh, the packages so you don't have to manage that separately. So uh, Mamba, Mamba is a faster wrapper for certain tasks of Conda, if that makes sense. Cool, no, that's, that's <laughs> um, very well, thank you. Yeah, so it, and it's like, orders of magnitude faster. Basically, it's the SAT solver piece of like when you give a bunch of requirements and then the package manager has to try and figure out what is <laughs> what is a solution to all of those version numbers. Mm -hmm. um, so from this template, you can uh, um, actually try this out. You know, we talked about before being able to uh, just create a code space here. I actually just made a new repo <laughs> uh, real quick and like, this is basically what I would do, you know, pretty regularly now whenever I see, or if I want to contribute to a project, like let's say I found like a small bug or something like that. Okay. It's a lot of work and my, as mentioned, my computer is kind of full. <laughs> so cloning a new giant repo just to make like a small change. Um, so uh, I can just go and create a new code space. Um, uh, I, like <laughs> size, yeah. <laughs> um, obviously that that does change how fast things spin up. Um, for the purposes of the demo, I'm gonna do it this way. But it really, I think, on the base tier, this is still under a minute. So, I think for the purposes of spinning up a whole new computer, that's not too bad. Yeah. Okay. And it also, uh, on top of that, that build time includes. Um, setting up and installing a Conda environment that might be in that repo. Okay. So, uh, yeah, and you can always watch what it's doing here. But I let's go back. I love watching the, 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 the build logs. Like I just, I, <laughs> sorry, I just like sit and watch. They're just like, oh, it's doing the thing. Okay, it's doing the next thing. I just, I get, can't get enough of it. Anyway, that's why they build mm -hmm. it. No, I'll, I'll usually just, these are my like micro breaks as I, I sit and watch and just have some coffee. Um, so yeah, we can look back at it, a completed notebook for the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we've got the outline. Um, other things that can be really nice. Well, hang on, let me just actually run some stuff here so I can get some variables going. Yes, I don't have a token set up, but that's okay. <laughs> Right. Yeah, to okay. to collect data from the GitHub API, you have to have like how many calls you can make depends on what token it has access to. Okay. Um, I don't currently have one set up, but that's okay. Cool. Um, I already I already scraped the API and it's saved as a CSV, <laughs> so I don't have to keep blowing away my API uh, call limits. There you go. So. I've uh, basically what we've got here is um, I've loaded, went through the API called. Um, so it's a page thing. We went through all the pages and then I just, it, it's huge. So I just picked some of the parts of the response that were kind of interesting and did my and or probably most of our favorite things, turn it into a data frame. Um, so what's you know, I, I can do all kinds of exploratory stuff here in the notebook, which is uh, obviously really fun, but sometimes it is really helpful to just uh, 
I do this a lot now. The variable viewer here uh, not only like shows you kind of, you can see here's my data frame. It's, mm -hmm. there's a few repos there, I think 92. But if I open this here, uh, the variable viewer also has a data viewer where I can actually just look through all of these things. <laughs> oh, cool. So it's, um, it's a quick way to just like check, you know, did, did I get, what I was expecting, you know, does are some of these any views on using polars? Uh, like, sorry, I was looking in chat, uh, Abby, like the polars package. I, I will come back to that. Um, but yeah, so like you can you can filter by different, you know, like if I want to look actually at only the repos that are HTML, you know, it just get, gives me a quick way to kind of poke around without having to like, <laughs> remember a bunch of pandas filtering and sorting and like figure that all out uh, here. Although Copilot um, and some of the other IntelliSense features do make that pretty easy. Cool. Um, oh, the library instead of pandas, got it. Um, I don't know, that's a good question. Uh, does the variable viewer support uh, uh, packages other than pandas at the moment, Sujin? Uh, it only supports pandas um, for the most part. It does support things like lists and arrays and things like that too in its own variable viewer uh, type. <laughs> um, and so it does that, but uh, I, I, if it does show something, it's not gonna be a super great experience. Um, but we are working on actually improving this experience. Um, I don't know if any of you who are joining in um, are super big on accessibility, but we are on the team. Um, and so uh, when we actually first built the variable viewer um, as well as the data viewer, um, there's two of them, variable explorer and the, and the data viewer. I always get confused with these names, but um, yeah, it's, <laughs> it actually, we built it with, um, a library that doesn't support accessibility. Um, so we're actually rewriting a lot of this too to make sure that it is accessible and, and that we are able to provide better experience for all of these other um, uh, libraries as well. Um, so that's that's kind of where we are at um, in, in terms of that. So hope that answered your question. Because I should actually run the cells in order, huh? Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so some other things that, um, and, and please interrupt me whenever we have other, if there are other things that we need to talk about, Don or Sujin. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think another, other very do helpful wanna, things. Yep, do we want to talk about um, Data Wrangler and LiveShare and all of that too? Ooh, yes, yes. Um, I can do live share real quick and okay. swap back to you for data angular. Sure. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, this it's currently making a cool, um, just like in other Jupyter notebooks, you can have uh, interactive visualizations or plots or just kind of the nice like HTML formatted cells and it uh, looks real cool. Um, so one of my favorite <laughs> VS Code extensions of all time uh, is called Live Share. Um, is <laughs> does this profile have it installed? Uh, <laughs> it's installing right now. You heard me. Um, so basically, what it does is um, it creates a link, kind of like you know, different online like. Um, doc like Google Docs or Office Online, you can just share a link um, to a document and then see everybody's cursors and work together in that space. Live share is basically a way you can do that with your actual VS Code window. Um, and this does work whether you're working with it locally or in the browser. Um, so all you have to do to actually do that <laughs> is uh, obviously install the extension. Um, Oh, we didn't get to dev containers yet. Uh, anyway, um, but yeah, so it basically copies a link uh, to your clipboard and you can share that link uh, with anyone. Um, should I put it in chat or should I send it to you, Sujin? You should just send it to me, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I, so I, I do this on Twitch sometimes where I just put the, the link um, just in Twitch chat and people can come hang out. It's it's really easy to um, 
control also what permissions people have. So if you invite them, it doesn't mean that they can just come in and start editing stuff. You can give people kind of, uh, there's some nice fine green permission controls on that. Good, cool. <laughs> Jay's like, no, don't yeah. do that. Y'all, y'all, you gotta be, gotta be exciting here. No. <laughs> um, yeah, so you can see like, um, Panda, this was the Panda's profiling extension or uh, package. It's uh, really cool if you're just doing, again, kind of general variable exploration. <laughs> there will be chaos. <laughs> well, so the thing is, yeah, and by default, when you invite <laughs> Jay's, like people will start doing rm rf, uh, when by default, any share link starts as view only, no terminal access. So, like, you can, all of those things are permitted separately. So uh, they try to make it pretty safe to start with. But yeah, then, you know, you can have people join and it's awesome. So yeah. Do you want to do data wrangler then? Yeah, um, I, I'm joining your session right now. So maybe later oh, yeah. you can show how that works. But um, yeah, yeah. yeah, we actually we wanted to mention live share because uh, it's been one of those things where it's been actually like will be the first to admit that it's been pretty buggy in terms of uh, notebook experiences. Um, but uh, the live share team has actually taken on upon themselves to actually improve that experience. We've been giving them a lot of feedback and they've been very responsive to that. Um, so it's been improving a lot, um, you know, but if you, if you try it out, um, and you like the experience or you don't like the experience, always feel free to let us know as well. And we'll, we'll actually pass that along to the team um, so that, you know, the, the live share can, team can can work on better, even improving uh, the experience that we currently have. Um, so that, that's one of the, the main reasons why we wanted to talk about live share. Um, not that it's like new, but it's just like almost like new and improved, right? It's like yeah. it's, it's, it's a gazillion <laughs> times better than it was before. <laughs> we know a lot of mm -hmm. cool people putting a lot of cool work for live share. So try it out some more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then, uh, yeah, Data Wrangler. So maybe we can switch back to my screen real quick. Yeah, um, can, do, can do. And um, I have this, uh, just, just another um, notebook uh, opened on my local instance of VS Code. Um, what I'm doing is I'm just importing some CSV file here. Um, is this big enough or should I make it bigger? Is that bigger? Uh, bigger. Bigger. Okay. <laughs> bigger. Um, like Zoom level four or more. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Is that good? Okay. All right. So, um, what you would currently see probably in, in your VS Code is um, without the Data Wrangler experience. So if you did housing.head, this something like this is what you'd see. Mm -hmm. But with Data Wrangler, I currently have um, uh, an official kind of this uh, Data Wrangler extension installed on, on my machine. Um, and so what that does is if I run this, now I get this button called launch Data Wrangler. And it's okay. going to look in in the most basic sense, and I don't want to offend the data wrangler team, but in the most basic sense, it's gonna look like the variable viewer, or not the variable, the data viewer. Um, but it's much cooler than that. So if you click on that button, it gives you so package obviously. I forgot to do this, but it, it makes, so th what they do is they make it actually really easy for you to get started. So if you don't have, it like detects any of the packages that you don't have installed. So if you, so that you can actually install them with a click of a button. Um, and then once that's done, um, it might reload my window, but we'll just let it do that. Um, and you'll actually see a better kind of version of, um, of the, your data viewer that you can actually interact with. Um, the whole point of this is, you know, you all, you've all seen the data, but you're, you know, as you're dealing with data, the single most thing that takes so much time is cleaning your data up, right? And just yeah. like making sure that your data looks right. Um, and so this is what you will basically see. Um, cool. Yeah, so it just loaded 20,000-ish um, uh, uh, rows of data. Um, and you can kind of see all of your data, you know, in, in this kind of chart form as well. Um, so that you, you know, you can see the distribution of your data um, uh, and uh, even for things that don't have um, numbers, um, right, you can see some of the, the stats for, for your data as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty cool. cool tool for you to just even look at. 
Um, but the name Data Wrangler is because you can actually wrangle your data. Um, so uh, this is the data for houses in California from like 20, 30 years ago, I think. Um, okay. But as you can see, like total rooms, for example, you're probably not going to have rooms that are like, I don't know, 16,000 rooms. I don't know if like, I, I don't know what happened here. It just looks like noisy data. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, let's just say like we want to, um, for example, like filter that data so that it only looks at the, the, the ones that make sense or like the ones that have like kind of actually reasonable amount of um, people who have answered it. So let's just say something like we pick like. 8,000, for example, and we'll say, let's just ignore all the data um, that's up here. So what you would do is you just go to filter mm -hmm. um, and that my target column is already selected because I have that selected already here. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll say, oh, this is it's very difficult to see with a bigger screen um, or zoomed in screen. But uh, let's say that I want to keep just things that are less than or equal to, I don't know, what did I say earlier? Um, I think, I think I said, 16. Like, 16 is, is that what I said? I Something so. like that. This is testing my recall, <laughs> my short term recall. Uh, maybe let's just do something like it doesn't make sense, but let's just do 500 for, for the sake of this sure. uh, real quick. Um, okay. So we can get a little bit better. Yeah. So you can yep. kind of see like preview of what your, your data, the wrangled data might look like, not just for the column that you're kind of filtering on, but every other column as well. Um, okay. And you can choose to accept it or discard that whatever change you made. Um, and let's say that I apply it. And now you'll see like all the cleaning steps that you've um, kind of done uh, in, in this like cleaning steps uh, area here. Um, super cool i mean there's just a whole bunch of um uh just like wrangling operations that are common so what what the team did was um, we work with the microsoft research team um to essentially uh look at all the cleaning operations done with notebooks on github.com um and then we looked at some of the popular ones and we said okay let's make sure that those are in here so um, any of the find and replace like you can drop duplicate roles, or you can say, um, let's fill in missing values based on, uh, you know, you can fill it with like either wh whatever you want to or based mm -hmm. on median or, or what have you. So there's just like so many cool things that you can do with this data wrangler. Cool. Um, and then what you can do is, um, uh, where was that button? Um, you can preview code for all steps. Um, so what that does is it actually just generates a code for you. Um, so that it's not just a preview that you're seeing, you can actually make it reproducible by copying and pasting it directly into your notebook, for example. Um, and so it's it's a pretty cool tool. It's not available, what happened? It's not available just yet. Um, oh no. Did I not copy it? Um, it's not available yet. Um, oh my gosh, my computer's spasming. This is why Codespaces is, is like the way to go for me. I like I do most of my development on Codespaces now, basically. Nice. <laughs> um, but yeah, like even though that stuff was like super simple. Oh my gosh, bug. Um, I didn't pray enough to the demo gods. Ah, uh, no, okay, you're doing anyways, great. Anyways, you get the idea. Life right? stuff. Um, <laughs> okay, great. <sighs> They do. But yeah, that's we wanted to kind of give you a preview um, uh, of, of that feature a little bit, um, but it will be GA pretty soon. And I think the team will be a little bit more engaged and, and talking more and more about um, uh, all the cool things that you can do with the data wrangler. So. Um, yeah, I'm sold. I just like you could have shown me the, <laughs> the the bars on the top of those columns and those summaries and the filter, and I'm I'm sold. So this is great. I'm really excited to to play with it when it's available. Awesome. Cool. Um, that's like most of the content that we have prepared. I mean, we will open it up for questions. I unfortunately cannot see the questions in chat for some reason. Um. But yeah, sorry if we haven't been as responsive on chat as much as, as we usually are. I usually love to bring them up on screen, but our, our chat bug broke. So I had to like, I don't know if you saw in the middle, I was just going like this. It's because I wanted to bring up the chat on my other window. Um, but yeah, Sarah, you, you raised your hand. You had something, you raised your hand, you had something to say? There's no raising hand button here. <laughs> um, it's it's uh, af after live share, definitely the one of the features that I'm using the most right now. Can you swap to me real quick? Sure, yeah. Um, oh, also Victor asked favorite themes. Um, 
laser wave uh, italic here. Um, Gosh, what's let's see, what else do I use a lot? Uh, Witch Hazel also yes! is great. By Thea. Yeah, actually, yeah. let's let's stay with that for now. Um, and there's also a great extension that actually will put what theme you're using in the uh, like footer bar there. Um, Okay. But anyway, uh, the thing I wanted to show real, real quick um, is uh, dev containers. So this is something that whether you're working on a project um, or like maybe you're a maintainer of, of a, like a larger project that other people are contributing to, mm -hmm. this is invaluable. So basically it's kind of like, it's based on Docker. So the idea is containerizing your project. Um, the nice thing is you don't specifically have to make a Docker file. Uh, you can use a bunch of kind of pre-made templates. But uh, what I've done, so this is for that uh, PyData Global Workshop that um, Don had linked to earlier. But basically what you can do uh, with basically just a JSON file <laughs> and a Docker file is I can say, hey, when someone opens this repo uh, in VS Code, in um, like, code spaces, uh, so far those are anything VS code based is the primary um, kind of tool that recognizes these, but it's an open standard. Uh, you can just look at containers.dev. But uh, the idea is that I can say all of the settings that I want set up, not just like the compute environment in a Docker, like in the Docker part, but I can say when somebody opens this up, please also install these extensions, please set up this as their default interpreter so that when they open it up. It's not only just that they can like open it up in their browser or in VS Code like instantly, uh, very quickly. Uh, you can basically, and, and this is how I stop cluttering. <laughs> I need to clean them out, but this is how I stop cluttering up my local machine. So I would basically just say, "All right, I want to reopen this in a container," and it will go through and basically. So if you're running locally, you need Docker installed. Um, there are lots of good resources online to do that. But other than that, you don't have to touch Docker. VS Code handles all of the communications. <laughs> um, so, yeah. That was a very good two-minute explanation. Just really, <laughs> and if anyone wants more details in how it all works, I there was a, the, I mentioned it before, the stream with Pamela Fox a couple of Fridays ago was really great. And we spent an hour kind of going into like dev containers and all of these around dev containers. And we got to like switch between dev containers and code spaces and back to VS Code, all of the above. So it was really great. Um, Okay, great. I'm sorry. I interrupted you, Sarah. Nope. Keep going. That's okay. I, I know we're probably at time, but, uh, or close to, but mm -hmm. I just wanted to get this in there because, like, literally that's how all of my projects start now, basically, is, I and, like, you don't have to write all of those files yourself. If you just go to the uh, um, command palette here and you mm -hmm. do, like, uh, dev containers, uh, add dev container configuration files, like, mm -hmm. it will... Okay, <laughs> I already have them here, but there's some nice like kind of wizard sorts of things that we'll walk through and you can pick defaults. There's some great um, Python and Jupyter defaults. So um, yeah, that's when I start a new project now, like that's, <laughs> I put things, you know, like the readme or whatever, then dev containers, then all of the other, um, you know, licenses and other things, but that's basically, uh, a required part of my workflow now. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, I. This one's been like this has been so illuminating on a whole bunch of different features that I've not had the chance to touch in this depth before. So I'm so appreciative, Sujin. You did an excellent. I mean, really, just like doing live demos is a tall order. You did an excellent job with all of those demos and demoed a new feature that just. GA'd or will will soon to be GAing. It's like I am so appreciative of the entire team jumping in. Oh, and we also lost Sarah. Um, so we're out a minute. Uh, we're, we're at, at time. I'm so thankful to everyone who joined. And because I didn't shout it out at the very beginning, like, thank you so much to the people joining from South Africa, from France. We have someone from Nigeria, Cyprus, Israel, Korea. Uh, cloudy San Diego, <laughs> uh, Toronto, Brazil. Oh, Sarah's back. Um, 
it's just so appreciative that everybody uh, joined. Um, thank you all so much. It's another episode of the Microsoft podcast, The Python Pulse. A uh, shout out to our producer, Peggy, who's been pivotal in getting the stream aired every month. If you just stumbled on the stream, you can find us on our Twitch or YouTube. If you like us, please comment or like or subscribe to the VS Code channel. There are a ton more awesome videos and streams that come out under this banner. So definitely check out the other things that this VS Code channel um, produces. Uh, you can also find Python for VS Code team at on Twitter at Python VS Code. And if you want to chat with us Pythonistas at Microsoft, you can join our Discord at aka.ms backslash Python hyphen Discord. Um, this is where we hang out and talk cool things snake all the time. Um, so yeah, we're just like a minute over. Thanks so much for hanging out with us. And we'll see you in two or so weeks. The second uh the second Friday of March. So we'll see you then. Bye, y'all. See Bye. everybody. <laughs>